I think we all know the key to a long and healthy life. Good genes, good luck, healthy food, regular exercise, and according to some, a clear sense of purpose. The sense of purpose is reason to get up in the morning. The immediate sense of purpose that came from this, I will want to be occupied and I will want to be purposeful. Feeling motivated to get out of bed won't just make the days go by more quickly. It could even mean extra days, a longer, happier life. So how should that play into our career choices? And does our definition of purpose change as we get older? I'm Jenny Murray, and this is Now I'm Grown Up, a podcast about living longer, career change, and education. Each week, we hear from people who've returned to the classroom, now they're really grown up, to retrain as teachers and give a little something back. Today, we're digging into exactly what that little something can be, and also what teachers stand to gain from starting afresh. Joining me is Mark Friedman, the author and founder of Encore.org, a non-profit organisation dedicated to making society work for all generations. Dr Martin Hyde, the Associate Professor in Gerontology at Swansea University, and Anne-Marie Lawler, who was for many years a civil servant responsible for the government's policy on career guidance until, you've guessed it, She retrained as a modern foreign language teacher with Now Teach in 2017. So Anne-Marie, Mark and Martin, before we talk about the importance of purpose in our careers and our lives, I'd like us to hear first from Kazruz Zaman, a lawyer who learned a surprising lesson when he retrained as a maths teacher. So my name is Kasra Zaman. I started teaching in September 2018, so this is now my third year of teaching. Before, I was a a corporate lawyer and I worked in the city for two decades. Having decided to teach maths, I think it's less directly relevant to the subject content. But there is an element of having been um, someone who started off doing maths and sciences and then switched over to law, being able to articulate to the students that that ability to be able to analyse things, to be able to um, solve problems, all of those things are directly applicable. So some of the questions that you might face from students as to why do we need to learn these things in maths, sir, it makes it more easier for someone like me to be able to answer that, to say, look, even though I went from being a mathematician as a student, as what was my strengths, to being a lawyer later on in life, that was directly useful and relevant to me. Equally, when I stop a student and say, please have another go at answering that question using full, proper English, good communication skills, I can also say in the world of work, when you transition to that, communication skills, being able to articulate yourself and express yourself fully and well is really, really important. So in terms of what I've got out of teaching, I'd say the first thing I'd highlight is a very clear sense of purpose, uh, which is helping young people, particularly young people from less... Um, advantaged backgrounds to think about their futures and prepare for their future careers. Secondly, at a personal level, also being surrounded by um, other teachers who and seeing the level of dedication and commitment that they have as well is also very uplifting. And also, I'd say, being surrounded by young people, there is a level of enthusiasm and energy that they have as well, which gives you an extra spring in your steps when you're in the classroom. But if anything, where it's been more eye-opening is actually having lived in London for such a long time and probably felt that I had a reasonably good idea of what London was like and what different people from different backgrounds, what their experiences might be like. Being in the classroom, interacting with the students, getting an insight into their lives and into their home lives and into their home environments has really been quite truly eye-opening and made me realise there's so little that I knew as to what really was going on in terms of the wider society on our doorsteps. That, I'd say, has been the bigger transition, whereas before I started, I worried more about the subject content. The reality is getting to know what's going on in the world around us and adjusting to that has been the bigger, more eye-opening challenge. And that was Kazruz Zaman. Amari, if I can start with you, what motivated you? To become a teacher? 
I was absolutely determined never to become a teacher. Um, my father was a teacher and I didn't think that looked like much fun. And so I spent a very long time thinking, well, whatever else I do, I won't be a teacher. I had a lengthy civil service career, which I loved, and then quit that after a lengthy illness and after a pause to regroup. Um, my eye was caught by Lucy Kellaway's article announcing now teacher. In fact, more importantly, it was caught by several people I knew emailing me saying, I've read an article and thought about you. Uh, so I went home and asked my children what they thought. And they said, that's a ridiculous idea. You're far too bad tempered and impatient. You can't possibly become a teacher. But the idea wouldn't go away. And so I thought about it some more, decided that I would give it a go. And the reason I think I wanted to give it a go and the reason I'm still giving it a go is I really like teenagers, most of the time at least. And I really, really wanted to do a job where I could see directly the effect my work was having. I loved my civil service career, but it's at several removes, often from the people you think you're trying to help. And so that's what brought me in. Mark, you are in a lot of people's eyes the father of the longevity revolution. In the United States, you've spearheaded this idea of bringing generations together. And your organisation, Encore.org, has shown the value age diversity can bring to schools, workplaces and communities more widely. I think it's fair to say the over 50s are an age group you know well. What would you say those of us in that bracket are looking to get out of life? Well, I I think people are at an interesting juncture because they're, um, they've got all this experience from their time lived, but they're also recognising that there's a lot more time left to live um, than I think previous generations did. But often with that comes a sense that that time is going by quickly. I, I always often think of it as, uh, you know, that f- great French Revolution <laughs> slogan about liberty, equality. This is uh, mortality, longevity, and urgency. Uh, people realize that life doesn't go on forever, but they read the newspaper and realize that it's probably going to go on for quite a bit longer, but that that time... They look back 20, 30 years and it evaporated quickly. And I think you get this, those different fronts are meeting and people are essentially experiencing a, a thunderstorm of purpose um, and a kind of urgency to not just uh, leave a legacy, but actually live one. Martin, finding that sense of purpose can, for some people, come through learning new skills, but Before we started recording, you mentioned that familiar expression that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You were quite dismissive of that. Why are you dismissive of it? Because I'm sure a lot of people do think, oh my goodness, she's a bit old for this. Uh, I'm not referring specifically to you, Amory, or to (laughs) me, although I am a bit old for learning new tricks. Um, How do you dismiss that? ages them so easily? I think on the basis of evidence that's out there. So I think when older workers and younger workers have been given similar tasks, you can see that older workers are equally competent to doing that. Uh, There's a nice theory that comes from organisational psychology called selection, optimisation and compensation, which shows that older adults are able to kind of do, they might not do things in exactly the same way, but the experience they have allows them to maybe achieve better results or draw on those experiences to find workarounds. So they might not necessarily be as fast, but they can get to the same goals by being smarter, drawing on that experience. I think one of the other things that we've seen during the pandemic, if there is anything like a silver lining that's come out of it, is that it's rubbish this idea that older adults can't use technology. We are having a Zoom meeting. I've been having Zoom conversations with my parents. Uh, We've been doing all this with our older adults that we work with. So the idea, the old-fashioned idea that older adults were technologically less competent, that's being kind of shown not to, not to uh, be true either. So I think whenever we kind of put those, those assumptions up, we have to question what's behind them. And I think it is ageism. So it's either ageism that's come from without, so the ways in which people, managers or educators think, well, that person is too old to learn for that. Or unfortunately, internalised ageism, where we dismiss ourselves from those opportunities because we say, I'm too old for that. And again, I think it's you know amazing to kind of hear Anne Marie's story about taking that you know quite scary jump, to be honest, uh, into a new profession and teach. I so both my parents were teachers as well, so I understand as well what the environment's like to to go into that. It is quite daunting. So 
Again, having examples like Anne-Marie and the rest of the Now Teach cohorts, the Encore Fellows, to kind of show other older adults this is possible, it is achievable. Yes, there will be some elements of it which are a bit scary, but they can be overcome. But, and again, I think to echo Mark's point, we need to put more support structures in place. And it's great to see the MOTs being rolled out in the UK, but more needs to be done, I think, beyond that. And we obviously, you had now teach to back you up. But how hard was it to say, right, I'm going to retrain and I can do it? I'll be honest, I cried every day for the first year, literally <laughs> every day. Mostly tears of frustration. Um, it's It's quite hard to go from being quite good at something or thinking you're good at something to being a complete novice and really not very good at it at all. I'm, I now think back to my first year, which was in a school, not the one where I, that I work in now, and I really wasn't very good because I was learning on the job. So it's, it's really hard. And that's why colleagues are hugely important. And my colleagues in both schools I've worked in have been amazing. But something like Now Teach really matters because it gives you a gang. It gives you a, a peer group that you can weep on the shoulders of, you can ask advice from. Um, there'll be someone who can say, you think that's bad, wait till I tell you what happened with my year 10 class. <laughs> um, and that's really important because uh, it's easy, I think, to chip away at your confidence quite fast if you are trying something, say, very, very new. And you need all the help you can get to keep your confidence up. Mark, I, I can see you'd like to add something. You made such a critical point, I thought, Anne-Marie, in talking about the importance of relationship in this stage of life, because I think that's a hallmark of, of this period. We now know from research that as we get to this point where there's less time ahead than behind, uh, we turn to relationship. That becomes a greater priority, and the, the skills for relationship, emotional regulation, empathy tend to blossom in this period of life. So not only are we drawn to it, to these bonds, but we're better at them. And there's a direction to all that connection that uh, the Harvard study of adult development, the gold standard of research on, on well-being in adult life has shown that older people who connect, nurture, mentor younger people are three times as likely to be happy as those who fail to do so. So uh, somebody's trying to tell us to do what you're doing, Anne-Marie, because <laughs> it's the route to uh, happiness and thriving in, in these longer lives. Jenny, could I add something? Yeah, I do. I just wanted to add that I think the big difference for me between this iteration and my first career iteration is that as a, as a younger person in my first career, I was always looking to the future and where can I get to. At this stage in my life, I want to live in my career at the moment. So I'm not looking to where I can move next or where I can be next. I absolutely want to be in the room I'm in with the people I'm teaching. And I think I, I'm loving that. I'm loving the energy I'm getting from living in the moment. But how much energy does it actually take? I mean, I haven't been in a classroom for years, either as a pupil or as a teacher, which I had done some years ago, but when I was much younger. And it took an awful lot of energy to do it really well. How much energy does your teaching require of you? It is tiring. It's, uh, it's a job that you have to be absolutely concentrating on for every second of the moment when you're teaching. Um, and I, like many now teachers, work partially. I, I don't work full time. I work four days a week. And that is very important to me to maintain my sanity and my health. So it is exhausting, but it's also very energising because every day brings something new. There's something hilarious in Every, if not every lesson, every morning and every afternoon. And that's also rejuvenating. I end the day exhausted, but I live the day feeling full of energy. Martin, yeah, can I, I add to that? I, yeah, do add to it. And I, I also want to ask you, because Anne-Marie said that one of the nice things about it was that she wasn't constantly thinking about promotion. Uh, how am I going to move up the ladder? Um, and to what extent do our attitudes to ambition change as we get older? Yeah, I mean, when Anne-Marie said it, I, my ears pricked up because there was a really good systematic review done about 10 years ago by Dutch colleagues that looked at, I think, around about 40 published papers uh, around the world, looking at motivations and how they might change as workers age. And it showed exactly that, that actually, as workers age, they become more interested in what they call the intrinsic values of work, the things that you can get out of it, the job catches that give you that sense of personal goal achievement, less so the extrinsic. I think it's not to say that things like job security and pay aren't important, but it's not the thing that drives. And I think that is really important for students and other colleagues. 
Because you're getting people that are there for the job. You're getting people that are there because they're interested in doing the best thing for that job, not for some sort of promotion and then leaving. And again, that's you know one of the challenges I think teaching is facing at the moment. Super high turnover, which we know is going to be accelerated post-COVID. So you're having students who don't have that continuity of teaching, which can be very disruptive in an already disruptive situation. So older adults... I think first thing to say is anyone who gets into teaching should be applauded at any age. You're bringing something to the table and doing a tremendous job. But older adults, I think, have other things to bring. And some of those might be older adults because they're they're teachers who've aged, and that's a value because they've stayed around, and that's brilliant. But also people coming in to teaching later in life also, I think, do bring the second set of skills. And again, the wonderful work that Mark does with Encore and some of the case studies that they have about people helping out NGOs with things like computer programming, with things like, you know, accounting and financing and strategic planning, which isn't necessarily in the wheelhouse of those kind of NGO leaders, but people who've worked in business in finance can bring that in and they get the buzz out of it because they're doing the social good and they know they're helping out those organisations. Anne-Marie, but what skills were you able to transfer from your civil service career into your teaching career? Well, the obvious one is working with sometimes difficult people. Um, (laughs) But I think the big difference is that in the civil service world, the difficult people generally pretend, at least pretend to be polite, whereas teenagers don't always do that. More seriously, working with very difficult people, juggling very, very many things were and remain useful skills. Uh, Being able to break things down, that's a lot of what I did in my various civil service roles, is chunk things down and analyse them. But teaching is a whole new level of that because you have to chunk things down a lot and be able to explain things incredibly clearly. And I realised I wasn't nearly as good at explaining things as I thought I was until I had to do it to a room of 13-year-olds who didn't necessarily want to be there. And I suppose most of all, resilience. Most careers, any career, I'm sure, teaches you resilience. But uh, you have to be resilient when you're taking up something new. Anne-Marie, do you know how your pupils respond to you as an older teacher? Have you ever had any ageism thrown at you from teenagers? That would be awful. I know it would be just awful, but I suspect it might have happened. They, it it interests me because sometimes they seem completely unaware that I'm an awful lot older than most of their other teachers. I think often they look at all of the staff and think we're all ancient. (laughs) Occasionally they notice that I'm older than most of my colleagues and they'll ask me how old I am and I generally answer 132 and and, and we move on. Um, It's not ageism, it's generally fairly affectionate. I told my one of my Latin classes this week that we were going to make a TikTok video and someone said, Miss, you know what TikTok is? (laughs) Now, actually, I haven't known about it for very long and I was taught about it by my own children, but I enjoyed that moment very much. And I think, as as I said, I think it's important they see people of a range of ages. Mark, what do you reckon are the benefits of an older teacher? For the pupils, what can he or she contribute? Well, first of all, I want to go on the record and say that I, uh, I too, am the child of a teacher, although I'm, I, my father ended up becoming a, a school administrator, partly for financial reasons early in his career, even though he was really somebody who was born to teach. And it was only after he was mandatorily retired that he became a, a substitute teacher and rediscovered his, his calling. So I had this family experience of somebody becoming a teacher in the in the second part of life. And I I can say for him, um, you know, the two big benefits were uh, ones that gerontologists keep echoing uh, and that Anne-Marie spoke to it. One is the sense of purpose, this reason to get up in the morning, a sense that your life still matters. And the second is connection to other people. And it's hard to imagine a a role uh, where you get more connection in just about every generational direction than teaching. There's so much that older teachers bring, and it's oftentimes not what we expect. Sure, they may have skills in math or science or or other established disciplines, but it's the more subtle qualities, like understanding the translation of the material to the real world. I, I've got three teenagers, and, and the constant complaint I hear from them is that 
what I'm learning in school doesn't really relate to anything I'm going to do later on. And to have somebody stand in front of them and be able to, in very concrete terms, explain that. But at the same time, I, I feel like it's a, a program for the teachers. I, Anne-Marie, I don't know if this is true for you, but you know, hearing Kazri's talk earlier about the now teach as a, essentially an empathy program, uh, a place where he's really getting to understand part of society and the experience of young people and what they're up against in a way that you could never realize through reading or through secondhand experience. Martin, let, let's just go back to this question of, of ageism and that, that sort of assumption that teachers do have to be young and energetic and not only need to be able to stand in front of the class and, and teach them, but also do extracurricular activities with them. Are older people really generally fit enough to do such a stressful job? I think it was uh, Ray Fiennes that ran seven marathons on seven continents in seven days or something insane like that. <laughs> um, there's a wonderful woman called Alex Rotas that um, photographs the senior Olympic Games every, whatever it is, couple of years. Uh, I think anyone who has any doubt about the physical capability of older adults, if they were shown those examples, would, would no longer have them. I also think that, again, going back to this idea of selection, optimization, and compensation, older adults, like any adults, develop strategies in order to be able to manage the demands placed upon them. And people who've had experience of managing lots of different demands, and again, I imagine Anne-Marie working in the civil service, uh, if it's anything like working at a university, you get demands placed upon you from every which way, um, with very short notice, uh, and you're expected to keep them all going all at once. So taking those skills into the teaching profession must be incredibly beneficial when you're having to, again, deal with a number of different uh, demands, both from the school, from the pupil, from the wider education authority, from policymakers, and able to sort of take all that and then uh, deliver uh, a, a good class at the same time. So I, again, I think with all these questions around the capabilities of older adults, we have to kind of ask, well, where's that coming from? And I think it comes from these ageist assumptions. And then the next question is to say, why would you put everyone over a certain age in the same bucket? I don't think anyone of any age would, would be comfortable with that. I don't think any 20-year-olds would be like to be, we think we're all the same because we're 20, just like 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds, let alone 50-plus-year-olds. That's 50 years' worth of life you're putting together. One of the things that we, we always say in kind of ageing research is that people become more like themselves and less like others as we age. So diversity in the population increases as we age. So you cannot make generalizations about a person's ability based on their age. It's about a person's interest, passion, enthusiasm for the job. And again, I think that's what you see when you see people coming into these professions or again into kind of helping out NGOs. And that's got to be the most valuable thing, not the date on somebody's birth certificate. And Mark, I suppose if you're someone with the kind of experience Anne-Marie has, you come into the school and you know so much about the world and how to develop a career, how to get the right qualifications for a career. How important is that for the, for the pupils that you're older and wiser? And, and also um, in a position to talk frankly about what really matters in life, uh, at work. At, you know, it's a lot more difficult for somebody, a young teacher who's worked very little to impart connections to, to the outside world. And, you know, I just want to echo everything that Anne-Marie and, and Martin were saying. I love that you use the, the long distance uh, example and refines. Work and life is becoming much more of a long distance race. And we approach, you know, the various chapters in that race, the, the laps in a different way. And I think it's so important for young people to see that there are different ways to work. Um, I was struck in, in the conversation, you know, about this paradox that with, um, you know, the assumption that people coming in at this later stage won't have enough energy, that they don't have as much time left in life. And on the other hand, what we hear over and over again is older people actually are more stable. They stay longer than younger teachers. For them, it's a, it's a destination rather than a, a way station towards something else. And so I, I think they're in a position to provide 
students a kind of attention that might not be there from somebody else who's thinking about what their next chapter is. Amory, what are the practical benefits of becoming a teacher? I mean, the pay is not necessarily stupendous uh, and it is hard work. What's really beneficial for you? Um, the most beneficial thing is the contact with the, the teenagers that I see every day. I, I can't put into words quite how energising it is to, to spend your day with people you would not cross paths with otherwise. I have children of my own, but they're, they're, they're slightly older. They're at university and beyond. Um, so I love the sort of jolt of energy I get from being around teenagers all day, every day. And although all teachers bridle when you talk about holidays, it is true that the holidays are an attractive part of, of, of the package, particularly the, the long summer holiday. Um, it's a chance to regroup and, and refresh oneself, but it's also a chance to do some completely different things, and that's a, a very positive thing. What completely different things do you do during the long holiday? I take myself off to Italy and sit in the sun and read books and eat delicious things. That sounds very sensible to me. <laughs> what does retirement mean today? What does that word that people keep asking me oh how are you getting on in your retirement and I keep saying I'm not retired you know I'm, <laughs> I'm not presenting the same program I presented for 30 years but I'm writing a column and I'm doing podcasts and I hate the word. Amory presumably you were seen as having retired from the civil service how do you see the meaning of that word now? I, I am seen as having retired from the civil service, though it didn't feel to me that I was retiring at the time. I thought I would, I knew I would want to do other things. I don't think I envisaged anything quite as full on as what I'm doing. Um, I'm not ready to go gently into anything just yet. I'm, I'm enjoying work and I'm going to carry on doing this for some time to come. And even, even when I stop doing this, I will want to be occupied and I will want to be purposeful. And that's, is really, it uh, feels very, very important to me. Thank you all very much. That is so interesting. It's giving me hmm, things to think about. I'm only 71 now. I wrote actually in an article yesterday that um, maybe I didn't have to worry about my carbon footprint because I was so old and, you know, by the time the new rules come in, uh, I'd be 85 and my editor sent me a little note saying, 85 won't be old. <laughs> so maybe that's true. But thank you all very much indeed. It's been so interesting to talk to you. Do subscribe to this podcast and follow us next time when we'll be talking about the powerful ripple effect of one's education. Thank you all. Now I'm Grown Up is brought to you by Now Teach a charity which inspires talented people to bring their experience into the classroom. If you feel like a change and want to use your existing skills in exciting new ways, head to nowteach.org.uk or if you know someone who you think would be an amazing teacher, send them this podcast. Maybe it'll be just the push they need. And don't forget to follow the show and leave it a rating on Apple Podcasts. Now I'm Grown Up is produced by Antonia Cundy and Theodora Leloudis. And the credits are read by me, Livy Podba, age 12.